So let me quickly introduce the panel and then we'll dive right in. Uh, Violetta Bolch is the, com the European Commissioner for Transport uh, in Brussels. Carlos Ghosn is the CEO of uh, the Renault-Nissan Alliance. Paul Jacobs, Executive Chairman of Qualcomm. And uh, Wendell Wallach, uh, a scholar at the Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics at Yale, who spent a lot of time working on these issues. Uh, and, and Carlos Gunn, I'd like to start with you to just tell us where we are with the technology and the, the adoption and what the roadmap looks for looks like for the next five to ten years. Yeah. Well, well, first we need to make a distinction between autonomous cars and driverless cars. Okay, there are two different things. And there is a lot of confusion in the articles. People think autonomous are driverless. It's not. Autonomous car, is, the driver is in the car, and he decides whenever he wants to drive, whenever he doesn't want to drive, okay? So it's about empowering the driver. You give him the opportunity to say, you can do whatever you want, okay? This is now, this is coming now. And just to yeah. give you some steps, uh, one lane highway autonomy it's already there. It's offered on a lot of cars. I can give you the example of Nissan. It's on a minivan sold in Japan today. 60% of the people are taking this option and they are paying for this option. So it's strong. There is a demand from the consumer. 2018, you're going to go on multi-lane highway autonomy. 2020, you're going to have an autonomy city driving, which is the most complicated case. Okay? Then you have the driverless cars. A driverless cars, a car without a driver, obviously commercial use, Robot taxi, Uber, etc. There is a lot of interest on this. And here uh, it is going to take a little bit more time. And here we're talking about more 2021, 2022. Now, I'm talking about mass marketing. And I'm not talking about having a prototype working somewhere or having a fleet of 500 cars. This is already there. I have driven in Palo Alto, you know, two weeks ago, a, a city uh, a driving autonomous car in a Nissan car. We have a prototype, it's working very well, uh, but we know that between the prototype working well and the mass marketing, it's gonna take two to three years because you, first you need the, the thing to work 100%. You need to take in consideration a lot of cases where it's difficult to make a decision. And also you need to wait for the regulator to allow you to put these kind of functions into the car. Okay, good. We'll get into that. I just want to emphasize one thing you said, which is the consumers using the Tokyo example. You have a minivan yeah. on the market that can uh, drive in a single lane without yeah. the uh, driver interaction. Consumers really want it. Uh, yeah. The World Economic Forum did a study saying there, uh, people are willing to pay as much as $5,000 extra. Yeah. That your experience? Yeah, it's our experience. First, he's very interested. We have a lot of feedbacks about this technology. But the first reaction is comfort and less stress, OK? Well, it's un until you experiment this technology, you don't see the difference between driving with your hands on the wheel, eyes on the road, paying attention to everything, and driving without having to intervene into the car. There is a big difference in terms of stress, particularly, let's not forget, People spend, in average, on the planet, two hours in the car a day. Two hours a day. In the United States, it's a little bit less. It's one hour. But uh, this is an important element. On top of this, you need to take in consideration the fact that it's much safer. 90% of the accidents on the road are due to human error. So the more you put autonomous drive, the more you have driverless cars, the more you're going to reduce these accidents. Uh, Paul, the connectivity and the infrastructure to support this is, is part of what you do at Qualcomm. Do you see the timetable about the same way? Yeah, well, I mean, we're, so the industry is working on 5G, and 5G is all about mission critical, high reliability, uh, very low latency. Latency means, like, I do something, and when do I get the response? And you can imagine that that's going to be very important. If the cars are talking to each other, and there's a car up ahead that stops, and they're following each other, kind of platooning for aerodynamic reasons, you don't want the one to stop and the other one not to find out about it too late, right? So, so that's what, one of the things that's coming in. That's 2020 time frame. Right now, you know, we're looking at uh, platforms that come out of the smartphone space. We've got machine intelligence in there. We've got computer vision in there. We've got all of this sensor in integration. And we're doing things where when we allow that kind of capability in the car to talk to not just the cloud, because that's a little slower to go, go to the cloud, but to infrastructure in the, in the city, I think that's where we're going to really see some benefits relative to, uh, to deaths. I mean, there's 13 pedestrian casualties a day in the United States, and we're going to fix those kinds of things as well. It's not necessarily autonomy, but it's in the car 
talking to the smartphone to the people that are around because the car knows that it's coming up too fast to a red light or something like that. As you know, there's a phrase in Silicon Valley, Valley about the minimally viable product. You know, you put something out there quickly and then you iterate. That's not a good approach for this uh, technology. Personally, I, I hate that idea. I mean, I, I think the whole notion of beta testing mission critical software on your customers is probably not a good one. And we've even seen that happen. You know, after the Tesla decapitation accident, the guy gets up and says, oh, well, the feature was coming in the next release that allowed the car to detect a <laughs> truck coming across. In my mind, that's not a product. So we can't do that as an industry. I've already been through a number of cases where technology got rolled out and it, and it disappointed the customers in one way or another. Handwriting recognition is a perfect example. If you go way back when, uh, they had handwriting recognition in an Apple Newton and everybody mocked it. And we didn't have handwriting recognition. We still kind of don't use it, right? So we need to be sure that we don't ruin the customer's expectation and set the whole industry back 10 years by doing that as well. Uh, Violetta, are the regulators ready for this? Well, that's a very good question because uh, there is a lot of things happening at the same time. Mobility is being pretty shaken up uh, with uh, many different trends. First of all, decarbonization. We have a mm -hmm. lot of changes now happening because we really want to decrease this, uh, all the impact on the nature. and. Transport is one of the biggest uh, polluters, and especially road transport. So here it's a big push for alternative sources of energy uh, and new propulsion systems, new technologies that will really enable this. So this is one track. The other track is that digitalization is now offering all these incredible functionalities that not only um, make the drive more fun, but as uh, colleagues already pointed out, really addresses the safety issues, which is uh, related to um, uh, co connected vehicles, uh, cooperative vehicles, auto, uh, autonomous vehicles, and then, of course, driverless vehicles. So these are, uh, uh, there's lots of concepts. Uh, at the end, somebody has to pay for it. So uh, there has to be a consumer who is willing to pay into all these changes. So I'm uh, a computer engineer by profession. I'm very enthusiastic about what this is happening. Uh, but uh, we really need to understand uh, the human behavior. And the statistics also show that people change the car seven to 10 years uh, cycle. So um, if we take that into account, I don't know how these figures that we, uh, we hear from the industry could be really met. But uh, of course, uh, there is no doubt that this is the trend, that we are going in this direction. Uh, on the European Commission level, we changed the process that uh, we prepared the regulations, and we are now in the early innovation cycles together with the industry. We uh, co-create uh, and understand what uh, the technology, um, how the technology will be driving the changes on the market, so we try to tap into this. But I will be a bit cautious about uh, the speed um, because the we, speed of adoption, the speed of adoption, because of the ad 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 uh, adoption capacity of consumers, um, maybe one percent, ten percent, but let's talk about ninety percent people in India, people in China, people in um, in uh, rural areas. Um, it's going to be an interesting trend, but I'm sure that this change will be happening from different. Uh, sites. So we're going to have many roads that will lead to the final uh, destination. Uh, we know already today, I, I fully support the idea that uh, autonomous cars are already here. We see them in uh, controlled areas and campuses. Uh, airports are using uh, this technology to move uh, uh, freight around and things like that. And this will be just getting stronger mm -hmm. and stronger and stronger. But to uh, bet on the mass introduction of this, um, we will probably you're, take you're a talk, longer time. You're talking about consumer, uh, consumer adoption, yes. uh, but, but, but what's the regulator's view? I mean, I, I just put up this uh, yes. slide that shows many of the public benefits. You already talked about pollution, uh, uh, more efficient spending. So there are a lot of big gains to come yes. from this. Do, do you feel you need to uh, slow the process no, of adoption? No, we're not going to slow the process. As I said, we are working with the industry now. We are reshaping the way how regulation is done. Uh, but uh, we are staying technology neutral, which means we put out, for example, last year, 
two important strategies. One on CITS, yeah. which is uh, cooperative intelligent uh, uh, transport, and the other one strategy on decarbonization, where very clearly stated what is the direction and what is the final goal. But how the so technical solutions will then emerge within these strategic orientations is, of course, up to the industry and up to the market to decide. Wendell, all sorts of interesting societal issues, uh, <coughs> ethical issues, you know, uh, insurance issues, uh, how you, what, what, um, how does the technology answer? Uh, what, what, what do you see as the sort of key sticking points here that have to be worked through before we can move to fully driverless? Uh, well, there's part. truly a, a broad array of them. I think the first one was who's truly accountable when these systems fail, particularly if there's a trade-off between the car and the driver at times. But that's been largely solved because I think the industry has recognized that few courts are going to hold, hold the driver or the human driver accountable if something goes wrong. And the industry has more or less decided that the benefits are there economically where they can take on the accountability. The big ethical challenge that people have been talking about for a long time, which is sort of a, a false challenge, is this trolley car problem. Trolley car problems have been around since 1967. They're really ethical thought experiments about what people would do if you have to make a choice between saving five lives at the expense of another life, but it requires an action on your part. And these have recently been translated to driverless cars, and there's been a lot of publicity around it. And there's been some research on it, and it's found that consumers in general say the car should kill the least amount of people, even if it means it kills the driver or the occupant, or at least the humans who are occupying that car. Except nobody's going to buy that car. All the, research, all the research shows that. So in order to stop a once in a trillion mile event from happening, we want the, dry, the car to take an action that will stop millions of people from buying driverless cars. And if they don't buy driverless cars, we're likely to see thousands of deaths that would have happened that perhaps could have been stopped with the use of driverless cars. <coughs> it's just showing it's kind of a false challenge. But the interesting thing about this particular challenge is it's brought to our attention that driving is not simply a lawful activity where a car stops at a stop sign, and if it sees a ball, it gets prepared to break in case a child is anywhere in the vicinity. No, it's a social practice, and there are these countless different situations that can arise that there is no simple right or wrong, or perhaps even technological solution for what the car should do. So consider four cars coming to the uh, uh, four-way stop at the same time. Who goes? What happens if the human drivers are gaming the driverless cars? Consider New York City and the taxis trying to game the driverless cars. The driverless car might be stuck at an intersection for a long period of time. So we have this array of both practical and ethical and finally legal and accountability issues that are coming into play in this space. And we don't have the technology yet. The technology isn't ready for prime time to solve them nor have we as a society decided how we want some of these challenges to be handled. In other words, they don't get decided by existing ethics. We have to come up with new norms. We have to agree upon what we would like. Carlos, how are you, how are you dealing with those questions? No, you, you have to... No, yes. It's totally logical. Well, I totally agree. That's one of the reasons I'm telling you. Autonomous cars are immediate. Driverless cars are going to take some time. Not only because of technology, we still have some problems to solve, but I'm very optimistic about the solution to the technical problem. But there are many, many questions uh, which have been uh, outlined here, which are totally true, about you're putting a machine without anybody uh, in, in this machine on the roads. And we know that there are some cases where it cannot make a decision. It cannot make a decision. Or uh, you know, if you wanted to make a decision, you're going to have to make some uh, choices and some priorities. And the car maker alone cannot make these priorities. He's going to have to go to the regulators uh, yeah. to tell him what are the priorities into, into these cases. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing now in order to solve, again, we are in prototyping here. We are just testing, is when the car is in front of a situation that it cannot solve, whatever powerful is the computer you're putting into the car, uh, because the car is in front of a situation where it's a no, no, no. Okay, So it stops. Then it has to go to a human being sitting in a control tower 
and give him the photo of the situation, and the human being tell him, okay, cross this line. Okay? Because I know there is no car coming, cross this line. You have plenty of nose. This is a no you're going to break. It's human being. By the way, it's not very far from what NASA's doing. You can ask yourself today, when NASA sends something on March, plenty of computer, still a human being is on Earth and making, in some cases, some decision. We are collaborating with NASA to try to say, when the machine or the robot is in front of situation where you have plenty of nose, what do you do? What they do is come back to Earth, and we tell you exactly what we do. Now, it's, mm. with the power of computer, this situation is less and less frequent because you're solving more and more problems. But we don't foresee a situation yet where the car can solve all the problems in a way where there is absolutely no ethical uh, problem or value. Like That's why I'm saying autonomous cars are here because you have the driver in the car, and at the end of the day, he makes a decision. And when the car has a problem, it gives back the control to the driver. But when there is no driver in the car, situation is a little bit more complicated. Technically, we can solve it, but there is still a lot of things going on. But I think what I heard you say early on, Carlos, is if it's a tough ethical decision, it's not yours, it's hers. <laughs> <laughs> it's obvious. It's obvious. That means at the end of the day, when it comes to between different evil, what are you going to choose? It's up to society to decide. So how are you going to do that? Uh, here, I'd really like to invite us all to, uh, to accept that this will be a transitional long traditional period. Uh, we all know that these technologies will be deployed sooner or later. But uh, I would like to bring an attention to a really big uh, difference uh, between the classical experience of digitalization that we've had so far, when we were worried about digital identities or worried about lost or not lost data, about accumulation of data, privacy of data, all fine. Now, for the first time, we're seriously talking about a consumer product that has no chance to go to 2.2 uh, version to be really good. It has to be good at the beginning, because we're talking about lives. Hmm. Yeah? We're no longer talking about lost digital identity. We're talking about lives. And that's why I keep saying we will follow that, but we need to learn. But we need to learn without another exam. Yeah? So this is going to be really safe and secure steps that we will be walking. Um, regulators will follow that. We are here, as I said, we are following this development. We are working um, with industry very closely. We need to engage NGOs much better than we have so far. Uh, and to really start thinking about also more complex, uh, complex issues are social issues. I'm very much fond of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the final results because it's going to bring incredible mm. benefits to social innovation. We are seeing then uh, bringing back to social life elderly people. And for co of course, for the European Union, that is a big uh, issue. Uh, we're bringing back disabled people in a full-scale social life. Uh, they're going to gain independence again. So these are all very exciting uh, benefits that we will see at the end. But we need to walk this path very cautiously and uh, really be sure that the, the technology that is deployed is safe, that we can use it, that we really know what is going on. Um, but uh, I'm very hopeful. Yeah, no doubt about that. It's just that let's not be too hyper about it. Be very, uh, very responsible. I, just, I wanted to go back to the issue about the autonomous driving. Because even with the driver in the car, that driver is going to get lulled into a false sense of security. And so when something critical happens, do you really want this driver that's been very distracted, not really aware of the situation around them? So I think for autonomous vehicles, even the early versions to work extremely well, there's going to need to be a lot of situational awareness. The car is actually going to need to be monitoring what's going on around it and start to project, uh, predict when some kind of a situation may come up so that it can cause you as a driver to be a little bit more aware and focused on what's going on around instead of reading my paper, or watching a movie, or doing whatever else I'm, I'm doing. I think that aspect of the human-machine interface is going to be an interesting area for all of us to work on for a little while. And machine intelligence will help a lot. And doing these kinds of things where the car is actually monitoring the state of the driver I think this is going to be an important technology, and people don't talk about that all that much. But there are real problematics in the trade-off between a For driver sure. and the system itself. Even if the system anticipates that it's coming upon a situation that it doesn't know what to do, that doesn't mean a human who is napping or picked up a book or is texting is going to be able to respond in time. Right. 
it's, at least in the U.S., it's starting to look like the courts are going to rule against the car companies in those situations, and therefore I think the car companies are now understanding they are going to have to take on some of the accountability and liability, or at least through insurance or the pricing of the car and handling the insurance elements of that. But I also want to come back on what is really in the hands of the regulatory authorities and even in the hands of the car manufacturers and to what extent we, the citizenry, needs to be engaged in this particular challenge. Because at this point, we are talking about life and death. In some cases, these are experimental technologies that we're putting on the road. That makes us human subjects in research that we have never consented to be in. And that's one thing if, if, a, if somebody has downloaded software from Tesla and has decided to use that autonomy feature. But it's very different when you consider that someday there's going to be a high profile incident in which a civilian, perhaps a child even, is killed by an autonomous car. But we've, ha we've had that. Well, we had that, but it wasn't high, pr high enough profile. It was the Florida incident. But and I'm just saying there will be a high-profile incident. I don't know what will set that off. I don't know that it'll be the first or the, or the tenth. But, but we are moving into a realm where technology is moving into the driver's seat as a primary determinant of humanity's future. And we need to be engaged in what standards, what morals, <laughs> what norms we want to have set in place. And we need to communicate that to our regulators. And so is the constraint, is the biggest constraint here a technology constraint? Is the biggest constraint a regulatory constraint? Or is it a uh, political accept pu public acceptance political constraint? All of the above. Yeah, well, uh, if, if, I, if I, I... I was trying to get you to make a choice. Yeah, no, no, but let me... Let me let, I, I don't think the technical constraint is the toughest one. I don't think so. Yeah. I, I think we are advancing very fast, not car makers only, but also chip makers, uh, sensors makers. I mean, we know that we're going to be at the point where we're going to be solving a lot of problems. I think the issue is going to be much more, I agree, uh, societal uh, mm. values and regulators. Regulators are going to be in front of a lot of choices. Mm. But at the end of the day, they are going to have to decide what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, which is a tough choice. Yeah. Which is a tough choice. I'm going to tell you why. Because today, today, hundreds of thousands of people die in car accidents today. Okay? So if we compare this technology to a perfect technology where nobody dies, then it will never see the, the day. You have to compare it to how much you improve to the situation of today. How much life you can save compared to the situation of today. So what we need to take about what are the situations that are happening today that we can avoid with this new technology. It doesn't mean, and I agree, we have to be very careful that when the technology comes to mass marketing, it's done. It's not in development, by the way. I say, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Next year, I'm going to have this Sorry feature. about your head. No, I'm sorry. no, we cannot do that. But at the same time, we need to look at how much accidents we have on the roads today, how much debt we have on the roads today, and how much we can improve with this new technology. Yeah, the, so, the, go, the, the, go ahead. Oh, the, the big issue is that you've got a human, or actually lots of humans in the loop. If we had a system where it was all the cars were autonomous, and they were all talking to each other, and they all had full situational awareness, a lot of these problems would go away. I actually think the big issue is we will build technology that really understands the world around it. But then it's you know this issue of the New York taxi driver cutting the car off. Well. OK, it can, might make the car stop at a stop sign for too long. But actually, what I'm more worried about is as it's driving along, and then the, the New York taxi drivers figure out, OK, this is how that car reacts. And then the next software update comes, and then the car doesn't react that way anymore. Mm -hmm. Now they've got to adapt to that. And what happens when there's an accident there? So I think, I think it's actually the human to the, to the system uh, that's, that's going to be the most difficult part. Uh, that goes back to this step-by-step, -step, really gradual, progressive uh, introduction of these technologies. And I would like to mention, of course, very important standardization issue that the professor briefly uh, mentioned as well. Uh, this is something we are focusing on very much, not only on a country-by-country -country level, but uh, also on a global level. We want to reach standardized, standardized solutions. So I'm glad that G7 group, when at the last meeting that we had, we formed a special task group that it will now deal with global standardization. We're trying to also work together on the alignment of regulatory frameworks that we do have a common approach to that, because if people understand um, the social framework in what 
one state, uh, they should, this social framework should be the same in the other state or understanding of technologies uh, should not change when you cross the border. So these are a very important issue uh, that also need to be uh, resolved. But I fully support the idea that, of course, right now we have a challenge uh, on roads with the, uh, with the fatalities and it's unbelievably high. Europe is the leading one and uh, I would challenge the US statistics, but US right now is the best uh, place, European Union, how we deal with that, but we have 70 dead people per day on roads. I was just talking about pedestrians. Uh -huh. Okay, Car sorry. Pedestrians. But this is, uh, of course, very motivational figure. That's why I'm glad that uh, uh, the European industry got together and we made an agreement. And by 2019, uh, nine different additional features will be introduced in cars, which will improve road safety. This is a little first step towards and so, uh, cooperative. Uh, so a limited example like the autonomous single lane uh, mm. Japanese minivan, yeah. is that reducing uh, accidents? No, uh, obviously the experience is very recent because we started to sell this car one year ago and it's one model on the highway in Japan and as you know usually, I mean in Japan I follow the rules, not a lot of people, you know. <laughs> but You, have you to don't put, have New York you know, taxi drivers. You, <laughs> you have to imagine these technologies uh, in worse situation. You need to go to some emerging market city and test this technology. What's going to happen when people don't respect the rules? when people don't respect the rule voluntarily or why they don't respect the rule because there are safety. For example, I'm going to give you an example. There are some cities where at night, people don't stop at the red light because they are afraid, okay? Yeah. So you imagine an autonomous car uh, in a city like this, stopping at all the red lights where all everybody else is passing. So we have to adapt the technology to the local environment and what are the practices. This is where it's going to get much more complicated. So we're going to first test in cities like Tokyo, Paris, New York, etc., where well, things are, I would say, rather under control. But when you start to go in cities where things are not always under control, it becomes more complicated. Do, do you think it's even possible that regulators would say, okay, this part of a city is going to be autonomous a vehicles test. only, and then solve that by using maybe car sharing services so that you would go to some place and you would just be transported around by a car that you don't necessarily own, and therefore the system would be that much more controlled. Is we're, that a conceivable? Currently, we are working on a hybrid solution. So we do want to see how we can empower uh, non-digital uh, cars in order to be able to, co uh, to participate Coexist. in the uh, hybrid traffic uh, structures. Because it would be very, very challenging from the investment point of view uh, to really start dedicating lines. But uh, I'm pretty sure that in a city mobility, mm -hmm. urban mobility solutions, they might be zones where they will decide to only use this type of cars. Well, and uh, something similar is, is already happening with electric It's cars. clear that this is really a stage <coughs> process we're going through. And mm. Paul, Paul, for example, is pointing out perhaps where the future of this will be, that we will have maybe only self-driving cars in some regions. We'll have them all communicating with each other. But the infrastructure challenges between here and there are quite daunting. So as Carlos mentioned, we're starting with autonomy, with autonomous features in cars. We're then going towards self-driving cars. We will then probably be going toward the networking of cars so that they are, are communicating with each other. But, but those later stages, there's still a lot of ambiguities about about how that might unfold. The difficulty is at every stage we can see benefits. Mm -hmm. And at every stage we can see saving in blood. I don't think there's a disagreement among anybody about the benefits. It's just that there are these risks and how are we going to mitigate those risks? And can we take on some of those risks in a way where we still largely get the benefits? By some estimations, you may have as much as 90% less deaths mm -hmm with self-driving cars. I think the, those figures are exaggerated for reasons that we don't need to go into here. But we're talking about 1.2 million people dying on the road simply because an autonomous car can break much more quickly than a human can. An autonomous car is not going to be inattentive. Can, can I just, yeah. I think the cars will be networked much more quickly because mm -hmm. getting the connectivity into the car is actually a relatively simple thing and it doesn't have a lot of these other moral and ethical and human interface issues. And even if it's not built into your car and there's a lot of connectivity going into the cars, right now it'll be built into your cell phone and therefore the car will have some way or the, or the 
person will have some way of being networked with each other. So I actually think that will come quite quickly. And no dead zones, we hope. Yeah, well, it's also going to go car to car. Car to I mean, car, this yeah, whole vehicle to car, vehicle to infrastructure, and, and so forth. So I, that, I think we'll get that kind of situational awareness relatively quickly. Which, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say that that brings another very important topic uh, uh, on the surface, which is cybersecurity. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are very much looking into that, and we're hoping that uh, the <coughs> industry will take a closer look to a hybrid communication solutions, which we include many layers of uh, security, which means uh, including uh, satellites, uh, Wi-Fi, and 5G. But so uh, not only one will be able probably to address it, because it's a really serious issue. And, and no amount of protection will stop stop incursions from happening, right? Yeah, yes. right. But you know, the, the we as a car maker are responsible to make the menu Put the menu on the table, okay? Connectivity, autonomous, driverless, electric, zero emission, etc. We put it on the table, and then country by country, market by market, this menu is going to be decided with the regulator. So it'll be vary. It'll yeah, vary. Yeah, vary. yeah. We, we may have different solutions uh, in function of the market because we know that there are some benefits that are going to be driven by consumer demand. Autonomous cars are going to be driven by consumer demand. Driverless cars are going to be driven by consumer demand. Because driverless cars, we're going to be selling to robo-taxi company. We're going to be selling to Uber. We're going to be selling to this kind of company. But then you have choices that are going to be driven by the regulator. Nobody wants to buy an electric car because it's electric. No, no they don't care. consumer doesn't care. Uh, uh, the regulator, by saying, OK, this is the level of emission which is allowed. And by dro dropping this level of emission, automatically is going to be starting to move car makers and the consumers toward electric car. And I'm giving you a very simple example. The car makers today in Japan, in Europe, and the United States are practically the same companies, except that in Europe today, 50% of the car market is made by diesel, and practically 0% in the United States and 0% in Japan. The only reason is incentives regulation. and regulation. That's the only reason. Consumer looks at price of the car, total cost of ownership, resale value, safety, that's it. At the end of the day, the regulator has a lot of responsibility about, OK, I'm going to drive you more towards electric, tower diesel, tower gasoline, tower flex fuel in Brazil with, uh, with ethanol. So there, that's why we need to work together, because at the end of the day, consumer choice, choice important driver, regulator also. So given that, where are we likely to see this happen first? Paul. Where are we likely to see which, which stage happen first? I mean, well, we're the most seeing, aggressive adoption of autonomous and... and probably drivers. Silicon Valley, because they're used to this beta testing. Because they want to do it. Yeah. But, um, no, I, I think <laughs> it's where the question that I was talking about, will somebody set aside places where it's controlled? And my guess is that, that it will happen, in fact, as the commissioner was saying, in places where there's already a controlled environment. So it may be that housing developments get built specifically that have setups for autonomous vehicles in them, or a city center gets set aside, or a corporate campus gets set aside. I think that's where we're going to see the full driverless uh, capabilities uh, coming first. I wanted to just go back to one thing about cybersecurity. So we're already addressing this issue in the smartphone. And the sort of the state of the art thing to do now is to use machine intelligence that actually sits inside the device and watches the behavior of the device to see, does it start doing something strange? Is it, a, is it going out to some IP address that it shouldn't go to? Are sensors on that shouldn't be on when it's in a certain state? So it doesn't stop the hacker from getting in. It I mean, it tries, but it watches to see is, and make sure it spots it as soon as it happens. Right. There's multiple layers of defense, for sure. You want to keep them out, but when they get in, because they will, then you want to be able to watch the behavior of the system to see is it doing something strange. Now, of course, there's going to be a cat and mouse game between the attackers and the defenders. So now you're going to have another AI that's going to try and hide from the one AI, and we'll have a whole game there. And that's uh, gonna, uh, we could go off on a different panel on that issue. So I'll stop there. If we're going to mention hacking, we should start talking a little bit more about the dark side of what we're, we're getting into here. And I want to, I want to take this conversation into another issue that's going on, which is automation in general and job yep. replacement. Yep. And the, fa the question of whether that's going to all happen smoothly or we're going to see various elements of the society rise up against it. So we've already seen a situation in New York State where the Uber drivers now want to demand that Uber guarantee them 
five years because they have to buy a new car and they have to amortize it over that period before they get replaced by a driverless car. <coughs> but consider the situation when we have massive numbers of driverless trucks being introduced. Is that something that the truckers are just going to allow to happen? Or are we going to start to see protests against that? And, when you, and you can imagine all kinds of fascinating things that could happen. The protests, for example, hijacking four driverless trucks and shutting down a highway. You know, in other words, these are the kinds of scenarios we could get into because driverless cars, driving is a social activity with ramifications for every aspect well, it, of society. Well, it brings, up, it brings up an interesting point because obviously we've been through those kinds of adjustments before. I mean, half yeah. the population worked in agriculture 100 years ago uh, and, and no longer does. But what's interesting about this is just the speed of the change. I mean, Carlos, the, it seems to me the auto industry until recently pretty much was operating on the same model it was operating on 100 years ago. And all of a sudden, as you just said, now you're going through an electricity revolution, an autonomous revolution, a ride-sharing revolution, a connectivity revolution, all at the same time. I mean, the, the ability of industry and society and regulators to deal with change at that pace uh, is sort of mind-boggling. Yeah, well, but at the same time, it's a huge opportunity because at the same time you are reshuffling the cards, and you say, hey, there is a new game. Let's see who's going to be able to, to prevail. So I think a uh, lot of risks, a lot of op opportunity. But I can tell you that for car makers and car makers who can invest and betting a lot that the car is not a commodity but a very intelligent, it's going to become more and more an intelligent product, it's a great opportunity because you're moving away from the, from the commodity. You're moving from a transportation device to a mobile space, which is going to be smart. It's a huge difference. And even the value of the car, even for young generation. I'm always asked the question, uh, young people don't, are not interested in car. They're, they're not going to be buying cars. We're seeing it in a lot of developed country cities. Okay? But at the same time, because they want connectivity, that's what they want. They say, OK, I'm, I'm not ready to stay in a, in, a, in a car for one hour, two hours, do nothing. Now, with, that, with everything coming on connectivity, where you're going to be able to video conference, send text, play games, see your movie with the autonomous drive, or uh, a, a car without a driver, well, it becomes a very interesting space. On top of this, I mean, for the moment, you cannot move your house or your office, but you can move your car. So you can be in the car and do everything you're doing in the house and you're doing in, in the office, except that it's mobile. So it's become, that's why you have so many companies interested in the car. You're saying, oh, all of a sudden, Google, Apple, all these guys are discovering the car industry. No, because they are seeing the fact that this is going to become a very important object in the life of part of your industry. life. Exactly. So now people say, OK, so then the car industry is gone. These are the dinosaurs of the, not at all. Why? Because the car, in difference to all the other devices, like the telephone, is the most regulated object, the most regulated object. Because at the same time, that has to be connected. It has to be autonomous. It has to be zero emission or whatever. It has also to offer attractiveness. It has to offer comfort driving pleasure, what, what, what? safety, and all of this. <laughs> so it's, it, it's becoming more and more complicated product, what, what, and we're looking you, forward yeah, to it. Well, let, let, me ask, let me get your perspective on that, Paul, because I've, I work in an, in an industry when, when the media clashed with technology, technology, the technology industry won. <laughs> Google and Facebook took all the profits, and we're now struggling with the, the remains. How do you, the same thing is happening now in automobiles. You know, where is the value going to be created? So just on the, on the job side, I, I think that once the car is relatively autonomous, you might actually get, and there's car sharing, there, you might actually get cars that are for per, certain services. Like a car might drive up where I get my hair cut, or I might get my nails done, or I might have a doctor's appointment, or something like that. I mean, we might create all sorts of jobs because now there's going to be this very distributed set of so services Creates out there. new work opportunities. I, I think so. I mean, yeah. I, you know, we shouldn't say things are going to go the yeah, way I they are the right problem, now. And, you know, th there's the, going to be the question, some really cool stuff. The question with the We're, speed of change is when somebody comes, uh, when uh, t trucks, right? Uh, I, I'm told they're the number one employer of non-college educated males in the U.S. When those people are no longer driving trucks, they're not necessarily going to be equipped to do mobile nail salons or whatever. Well, some, I mean, wherever some people is. will get, look, there will be certain skills that people will be able to be trained to do. I think some of these are 
higher skilled and some of them probably are, are a little easier. I wouldn't, wouldn't expect the truck driver necessarily to become my doctor, but that may even happen because we're building all sorts of systems that are gonna allow consumer level people to do diagnosis. I mean, we are doing this Tricorder X Prize right now to do exactly, so we don't know. A lot of stuff is going to change and to take where we are today and project that out in the future and say, okay, there's nothing new coming. I mean, I can even, I can sit here and imagine lots of things that are going to come. But, but how, and then let me just go back to the collision between the car companies and the, or collision, the collusion, whatever it is, between the car companies and the technology companies. Is it harder for a technology company to learn the business of making cars or harder for a car company to, to learn the uh, sophisticated uh, technology? My, my experience when industries converge is that neither side really gets it and they have to spend some time to, to understand each other. A great example is in healthcare. When we started out with that a, a long time ago, all the people from the healthcare industry thought they were gonna become a mobile virtual network operator because they knew their industry was hard but they thought the other guy's thing was easy. <laughs> and everybody from the wireless industry thought they were gonna be selling diabetes test strips because that's <laughs> gotta be a really easy model. So it took a while for everybody to hard come to, together. I think we are doing minutes. that right now. And I would hate to see that there's this polarized thing where people actually aren't working together. I do think that those, those connections are being made, though, right what, now. What, yeah, what do you think? The only point I would like to say, just to add to the fact that we have to be very modest, prepare for the future, but not try to preempt it, because you, you don't know, is the choice of a car is not only a rational choice. It's also an emotional choice. I mean, choosing a car is something between choosing a refrigerator and choosing a pet, OK? You, you don't select a pet on a rational base. You select it for many other things. And the car is something in between. So we have to prepare still to create and continue to have this emotional link that you see clearly when, you know, particularly you go to India, Brazil, Russia, China, see the ceremony of buying the car and all the families coming and everybody remembers exactly what was the first car in the family and the link to the brand. This emotional side is gonna continue. On top of this, we're gonna build all this rationality particularly coming. And that's why we have to be prudent, not to preempt too much about where the consumer is going, but being ready to respond with a full menu. But I would like to jump here, here, because uh, there is another dimension that we should not overlook, which is a political environment in which all this will be happening. And these social issues are important. Uh, we don't have, at this point, really well-designed tools for re-education of all this massive change job <coughs> that uh, have not been experienced before because digitalization is really making dramatic shifts. Mm. And uh, it used to be in one lifetime that uh, these shifts happen, but now they're happening uh, two, three times in your job uh, lifetime. Yeah? So I think it's gonna be also elections that will uh, have a great impact on that because uh, people will be, of course, lobbying and uh, politicians will respond. So all that will kind of have an impact. I'm saying again, there's no doubt where the development is going, but in order to define the speed, all this will have to be uh, taken on, uh, uh, um, yeah. uh, on board. Well, One more thing, if yeah. I can uh, just quickly say. We are forgetting that uh, we are moving also to a completely new concept of mobility. We call it mobility as a service, where multimodality uh, will really play an important place. And automation has been known to public uh, transport already. I mean, there are many uh, autonomous and driverless uh, public transport already available in capital cities. So uh, this is uh, not a completely new experience. It's a completely new personal experience, but we've been using it. So mobility as a service will also play an important role and it will be a systemic solution that will come out and the cities will be looking at the system solutions more than just uh, individual mm. uh, uh, solutions. So all that will impact the whole Let's, acceptance. Uh, take some questions. Go ahead, you first. Right, right here in the second row, yes. And identify yourself before you sure. ask your Gary question. Cohen with BD. So first, I, this has been a fantastic panel, the energy of this discussion uh, of, of what I think is still a little bit of an unpredictable long-term picture. <laughs> but if I can ask one thing, let's no longer keep saying that in an autonomous car where the driver may be playing a video game or doing their emails or brushing their teeth, might be intoxicated, they may feel safe at that point or may doze off, that right at the point of an emergency, the control goes back to the driver. Absolutely. It's something we have to stop saying because it undermines the credibility of the whole principle. Or that it's gonna go to some 
somebody in a robot tower who, you know, the NASA analogy, that's one spaceship going to Mars. Here you could have hundreds of millions of vehicles. It may go to voicemail. We have to have an explanation other than that. Or, or I'm going to go buy a Model T and only drive on Sunday mornings at 5 a.m. because I'll be afraid to be on the road. The, uh, one other quick point I want to make. The estimates of job loss in the United States are 4 to 5 million associated with trucking, courier services, taxis. The absorptive capacity of any economy to redeploy to other skills and other jobs, which is already under great question even based on today, this has to be taken very seriously as one of the questions in terms of the societal trade-offs. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, two elements on that. I think actually the trade-off issue, which is one that's, that many of us have been talking about for about a decade, has been more or less settled. I think it's understood that the trade-off isn't going to happen easily, the driver is not going to be held responsible, and we're either going to have to have some kind of no-fault insurance or the, the car companies are going to take responsibility for that, and that will get factored in by the benefits that they, they see the cars um, will bring. So we want to have trade-offs, particularly when we're talking about autonomy per se, but that's different from saying that the drivers are going to be held responsible if something goes wrong. So I, I, I think actually we're beyond that particular issue. The question of tech unemployment, and, and I mean, we that's just one example of where this is converging with so many other issues. When you talk about regulation, it's not just driverless cars. We're dealing with a plethora of technologies that may, that really- Well, every are, industry has a version of this. Right. Mm. Yeah. That, that, this is, that really our existing governance systems systems are not set up to deal with, and we need some new, more flexible form, new, more adaptive form of governance. But in relationship to the tech to unemployment question, there's a lot of outstanding questions about how many secondary jobs will be created by, by these new technologies. There are questions about how quickly this is coming. So it's one thing to point out how many taxi drivers and truckers there are. It's another thing to wonder, well, how many years or decades will it take for this turnover okay. to occur? Question in the back. Thank you. Uh, Zheng Xin from Caixin Media. This is a follow-up question about the industry convergence. So uh, right now, the players not only include the traditional car makers, uh, Googles and Apple, the big tech firms, there are also many startups. They are building smart electric cars from ground zero, from uh, scratches. And they are saying, we don't have a very profitable old model there that hinders us to move forward. We don't have the old factories, and we don't have the reputation like Google and, and Apple already had. So we can do everything better and faster. You need two to three years to test. We need <coughs> one and a half. And uh, uh, a more specific question for Mr. Gosu is, I don't know if you hear about a startup company called uh, Faraday Future in California, and they are, you know, I don't know how much we should believe them, including FF and others. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, there is a big boulevard. I mean, particularly you're talking about electric cars. Uh, there is a big boulevard for electric cars, particularly I would say in China. Why in China? Because the Chinese government, as you said, has stated very clear objectives about how much, how many electric cars they want on the ground in China. And I understand that by 2018 or 2019, they want 8% of the sales of cars be electric, while today it's less than 1%. So there is a huge boulevard. And where these cars are coming from, obviously the uh, classical car makers will not be able to fill the 8%. So there is an appeal to a lot of startups, a lot of people saying, OK, we're going to bring our own contribution, uh, contribution to that, which is fair. I mean, at the beginning, you're going to have plenty of company, you're going to have plenty of models, but little by little, selection is going to come from the choice of the consumer. And this is where when price start to come in, services start to get in, this is where uh, the car makers have a bigger advantage because they have a much bigger scale, and particularly, they have a much bigger network. I I'm not saying that the, it's already written on the wall, but I think when the bigger player who have already a network in the country start to go into this direction, they start with... They have some advantage. Yeah, exactly, some advantage. I've been in the Faraday Future car. It's, it's a real car, and, uh, and one of the things that it does autonomous, or driverless even, is it parks itself in a parking lot, and that's pretty cool. I just wanted to go back to the driver distraction thing, because you listed a whole bunch of things the person might be doing. They might actually be in virtual reality, and then their whole context of their brain is somewhere else, and they won't be able to context switch back 
at all. So that goes back to what I was saying earlier. The car has to have a very good situational awareness and try and predict when it is that it has to give the, the driver enough time that they can, and of course it won't work all the time, so there will be accidents from that. Uh, it's the human machine interface is gonna be the big issue, I think. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Eyal, I'm a global shaper from the Tel Aviv Hub. And many of the benefits of autonomous cars come from an underlying assumption that will break the, the model that exists today of one person in one car. This is what causes uh, uh, congestion and many of the other uh, difficulties with cars. But so far, history has shown that every time we have technological advancement in uh, uh, mobility technology, it just raises the demand for uh, owning a private vehicle. And as you said, this is an emotional experience. People uh, would like to still own their own car and brush their teeth there and work there and not have anybody interrupt them. Data today shows that people are not selecting the shared mobility option. You showed that in your slide before. Uh, not in Uber, not in any of the other carpool apps that were out there. What makes you uh, believe in the <coughs> assumption that people will choose shared mobility and not just buy more cars for private use and increase congestion and things like well, that? Well, Carlos, you're not going to be upset if they end up buying more cars. No, 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 no. no, no <laughs> let me tell you. No, I'm going to answer because it's obviously something we work because it's our business. Uh, I mean, this 2016, record year for the car industry, 91 million cars have been sold in 2016. This includes the fact that in many cities, people don't buy car anymore. Young people don't buy car, okay? Uh, we, we know this in California, we see it in New York, we see it in Tokyo, etc. This includes, which means there is room for the classical car industry to continue to develop, particularly based on growth in emerging market. That's what's happening today. And at the same time, you have an explosion of demand on shared uh, cars, shared services, et cetera. I don't think it's so either, it's either or. or. It's You're going to have both of them. And I agree that there is a lot of rationality into choosing transportation, but there is also a lot of emotion into choosing cars. And this, you're not going to ask people to say, OK, you're going to have do one or the other. They're going to do both. They're going to say, OK, this is my car. I'm going to use it 5% of the time, but I like it. I have a 4x4 four four, even though I'm driving in a city, etc. And then from the other side, yeah. I'm going to use more Uber into certain transportation. There is room for both, and we need, as car maker, to address both. Well, here the regulators will come in, right? Because the cities are <coughs> way too congested. Uh, congested. Uh, we need to really care about the pollution and things like that. So. Uh, we already have now a rule that the user pay, polluter pays principle, it will be uh, the charging mechanisms for the use of infrastructure will be reshaped. So everything at the end will have to balance. I mean, the cities will certainly push for more, uh, for, for less cars in the cities. They will push more for public transportation. Uh, and sometimes it w there just won't be any other choice. Uh, but uh, the number of people on this planet Earth is growing, uh, so we need to take that into account as well. And uh, middle class uh, is strengthening in the biggest countries like China and uh, India. And of course, all that will have an impact. That's why decarbonization will play a stronger and stronger role and will definitely impact also new models. If you use the lodging as, a, as an example, I mean, apartments did not kill homes that people own. Hotel rooms didn't kill the, you know, and we already see some things where there are, it's not an either or. There's some people will do this, some people will do that, and some people will do both. And uh, so. uh, overall increase demand for mobility, I yeah. would assume. Without any doubt. Mm. Right here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kumagai, and I'm a chief economist at the Daiba Institute of Research in Japan. And uh, I think uh, driverless car will change the nature of the automobile industry. Uh, because now the industry is the, to produce cars. But in, in the future, I think the industry might be the transportation industry uh, to uh, transport somebody or something to other places. Uh, in that case, uh, considering the uh, urbanization, I think uh, the automobile production will decrease dramatically uh, because the utilization rate of cars is less than 10% now. And I'd like to ask one question to Mr. Gohm. Uh, considering uh, such kind of uh, structural changes, uh, will, will your company uh, survive, uh, sustain the strength? And 
Uh, what will be the core value of your company, of Nissan, in the future? <laughs> and how this will is... you beat Microsoft, Apple, or Uber, yeah. uh, future competitors? Yeah, we, 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 this we is we an investor's have... phone no, no, call no. now. We, 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 we're not going to beat Microsoft or anybody. We're going <laughs> to join forces with them, and that's what we're doing, by the yes. way. We have uh, an agreement with Microsoft on connectivity and working together on the car. You, you, I don't think, I mean, obviously, the media likes to say, OK, this is a battle between X and Y and Z. <laughs> no, this is more a collaborative effort where everybody is trying to bring a contribution. We are working with Google. We're working with Microsoft. We're working with Uber. We're working with every, And all the other car makers are doing the same thing because we're not looking for the same contribution. Everybody has a different contribution. Now, uh, I don't think you should think about either or. What you're saying is right. That means urban mobility is going to change a lot. And the way I see it is certainly totally electric. Uh, lower number of cars, more shared services, etc. But let's not forget that because we are focused on Tokyo, on New York, on Paris, or on Berlin, or London. We understand that. But let's not forget that in China, where you have more than 1 billion people, in India, where you have more than 1 billion people, in Africa, where you have also more than 1 billion people, you have still very low level of motorization. In India, you have 20 cars per 1,000 inhabitants, while in the United States, you have 700 cars per 1,000 inhabitants. We cannot say, oh, I mean, we're going to look at India the way we look at the United States. It doesn't work. Even in China, with the boom of cars uh, sales in China, you still have 150 cars per 1,000 inhabitants, and 70% of the car buyers in China are new buyers. They never own the car. You're not going to stop that. Uh, Africa, we are at the beginning. You have 10 cars per 1,000 inhabitants in Africa. So you're going to have. This motorization, which is going to continue from one side, uh, and no, I don't think anybody's going to stop it, because this is a signal of autonomy. This is a way to get education. This is a way to get a job, etc. But at the same time, we need to face another situation, which is mainly an urban situation in developed country where you have more services. So car makers are not going to become only mobility provider. They're going to be car makers and mobility providers. I, I don't but, know, have you, have you considered also the fact that there's going to be more demand for mobility because there are classes of people that don't really get out of their house like senior citizens, and in developed countries where we're seeing demographic <laughs> shift, shift to much older populations, mm -hmm. I actually think that might be a source of demand. I don't know whether you've modeled that at all, but, but for sure, senior citizens are going to get out of their houses mm -hmm. in cars that take care of them and drive for them. Uh, much more, I think, than or, or than they just do people today. more willing to go places <coughs> if they can do something else. Yeah. If they can, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Laurie Dippenau from South Africa, I'm a banker. Uh, to what extent will the rollout in developing countries be very much slower than developed countries? Because in, I come from a developing country, and our infrastructure is often inadequate. Road signs not replaced, road markings are faded or non-existent, traffic lights frequently not in operation. And how does that affect the speed of rollout of this new technology into developing countries? No, I, I think the answer is uh, yes. We are all the tests that are taking place are taking place in Tokyo, in Palo Alto, in uh, Boston, in uh, Paris. Why? Because we need, uh, in order to test this technology, an infrastructure, uh, and we need reliability of uh, the existing infrastructure, new infrastructure and particularly a very good adequation to the laws uh, of, uh, of, of, of driving. So that's, that's going to give a lot of advantage to developed countries. Now, this being said, when this is going to be tested and mass marketed, obviously it's going to uh, develop in emerging, in emerging market. But we're going to need a lot of infrastructure. And that's why I don't think we can do it alone. I think we're going to need to discuss with the local authorities about how much they want this technology in their country or in their cities. And obviously, they're going to have to bring their fair share to this. And, and, and remember, there's a lot of connectivity even in, in developing countries. And for places where there, aren't, there isn't connectivity, we're actually in the process of building a low Earth orbiting satellite system that's going to give you broadband everywhere, including all of those places. So there is going to be the <coughs> ability for sharing of information, so crowdsourcing of mapping data and things like that as well. So there will be some technological solutions, even in places where there isn't existing infrastructure. I wouldn't underestimate what uh, the colleague just pointed out, because the, uh, <coughs> the capacity of uh, investments will play in a really important role also the deployment of these technologies. And probably the countries that are still trying to bridge the development gap will hopefully learn from 
uh, other countries and maybe invest smarter and uh, really see the big picture and use the systemic approach at the beginning and not trying to repeat all the steps that were done in the Go developed ahead, countries. Question. My name is David Barou from the French newspaper Les Echo. A question on affordability of those cars. This future looks really good, but uh, cars prices are more and more expensive every year, even though they are low priced cars. Also. Like phones. Uh, how will people be able to pay uh, for this? Do you expect the economy of scale to be very rapid and that the prices will go down? Or actually, the, the car will exist, but nobody will be able to, to really pay for it? No, the, the affordability is, is at the center stage, anyway, of our companies. Well, uh, you know, for example, if we take, I'm going to take an example today, which is electric cars. Okay? So the attention are more on the sophisticated premium electric cars which usually have a sticker price of uh, $60,000 plus, which, uh, which represent a very small portion of the market. We are addressing the core market. We're talking about driving the price down in order to really address the mass market. So, uh, uh, and, and, and we see a lot of response. So what I'm telling you, there is more visibility for the expensive solution, but there are a lot of solutions which are affordable. And affordability for us is the key to the mass marketing. Let me give you an example. In China, what is selling to the, China is the market which has grown the most in electric car in 2016, more than 100% increase. And what is growing are the low cost electric cars. It's not the $80,000 sticker electric car, which is obviously make front page uh, everywhere, but this is, doesn't represent anything in terms of how much contribution you're bringing to the lower emission. You need to address the low cost, the mass market, and this means affordability is center stage for us. Yeah, uh, and, and we're at, we're, God, I'm sorry, quickly. I was gonna say, car sharing can help in that as well because it'll amortize the cost among many more users and don't underestimate how much your smartphone's gonna do and be able to interface with a car at the very low end. Uh, we're out of time, but thank you. Thank all of you, very enlightening panel. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Huh?